AT&T presents Images and Realities, African-American Women, co-hosted by Dr. Deborah prothro Stiff, Halle Berry, Julianne Malvo, Queen Latifah, and Susan L. Taylor, with special appearances by Dr. Maya Angelou and Esther Rowe. The African mores, which have their their life in American life, general American life, were transferred by the African American woman. So that even the slave mother, when she could not herself uh, influence her daughter, because her daughter may have been sold, she did influence the white woman for whom she worked. The strong black women are permitted to survive simply because they seem to be less threatening. But I think there's a secret threatening power that maybe society isn't aware of because these women are so powerful. No one forgets Sojourner Truth or Harriet Tubman. I get a lot of my strength from knowing about, you know, Nzinga, Garvey, um, Harriet Tubman, all of those who laid the foundation and um, have made my mission clear. I am particularly impressed with Phyllis Wheatley, the poet, because here was a woman who had a love for poetry and who expressed herself through the poetry. I look at um, the life of Ida B. Wells. Um, this is a woman who was, was orphaned, had to raise her brothers and sisters, uh, was a writer. Um, she wrote passionately and, and actively about the facts that blacks were being lynched. And as a black woman doing that, she put herself in physical danger. Our education system is not working. We're falling behind as in comparison to the rest of the world. So for us as black Americans, we need um, some reinforcement of our past. My experiences have been that I've been in classrooms where I've been the only African American student, and the only thing I ever heard about me was that I was a slave, and that two or three of us could read and write, and there was, there was a dream, and that was it. <laughs> I think with, edu with education, you need to learn about everything, um, not just black history, African American history, Egyptian history, you need to learn about Asian history because everything influences everything else. Now young people don't know their history, and there seems to be a reason for that, because history is empowering. To know your history gives you a strength, a sense of who you are, gives you a sense of power. We need to be able to uh, pull together the lessons that our foremothers and forefathers, what, what they went through. Um, and without that, we don't have a sense of who we are as a people. I'll never forget, uh, as a child, seeing the image of Dorothy Dandridge on the screen and Lena Horne. And I thought these were such beautiful black women. And I wondered, where are they? Where are they? Where are, why aren't there more? In 1870, in all the legislatures of the South, there is this statement. By 1920, all the blacks will be dead or gone. Here we are today, upwards of 45, 50 million, still here. Uh, I'm concerned about some of the imagery in uh, television, in movies, uh, on the minds of young African-American uh, children. Uh, the, the images of violence, the images of, of sexuality without responsibility, uh, the callousness, the put-downs, uh, all seem to uh, come out at them, and they are defenseless uh, against some of it. African American kids are watching about 70 hours of television a week. I mean, if you think about what's on television, would you invite these people to your house? We allow other people to implant the seed in our children at the vulnerable time, at the time they're most fertile, their little brains are most fertile. That's the time you shouldn't let anybody but you teach that one. Our girls come to the education system often collide with a set of expectations that do not nurture or encourage them or let them know that they can be the best they can be. But here, a circle of influence, look. Dawn gets bright, Dawn's children becomes brighter. 
The image for Afro-American women, for Afro-American children, is that we can't expect very much of you anyway. And that expectation becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that, to me, is the saddest thing. I will answer all ambiguities in life. My thirst and hunger for knowledge will never be satiated. And it's happening now, where I go around the country and find out that counselors are telling students, even today, exactly what I was told, that I shouldn't be a journalist. Uh, I remember Mae Jemison, our, our black woman a astronaut, she was told that she didn't have the mind to study science courses. Well, I can say that it was very important for me to have a mother who was a teacher, who is a teacher, an educator, who understands how important education is to success in life, who was a proud black woman and showed me that, hey, you're a beautiful little black girl and don't let nobody tell you that you're not. You know, so it all starts in the kind of nurturing and the kind of messages you receive as a child. And that has to come from a close-knit family unit. My mother and father always seemed to make ends meet. Uh, and they always seem to do that and still allow the children to keep dignity intact. If there were problems, we did not become aware of it. I would say the church has been a very positive influence in helping me to raise my children because it provides, I would feel, all of us with the basic foundation to deal with the realities of the outside world. If I could, I would teach you all the things I never learned, and I'd help you cross the bridges that I My stepmother um, was a beautician, uh, there for me any time and all the time. I'm the oldest of six children. Uh, and it was really a, a, a great way to grow up. I remember just being quite happy the fact that I had two parents, two mothers. I grew up in a situation which is, is very common to uh, the black community where I was brought up by in an extended family. Uh, my mother didn't raise me. My aunt and my grandparents raised me. Well, my concerns for my children are that they are, number one, educated and educated in the true sense of the word, not just math and able to read a book, but understanding the complexity of the world and human nature so that they can go out here and survive. It's so important for parents to listen to their children. It's so important for them to really listen and understand that children have a great deal of wisdom. I think that kids today are lacking a strong sense of self-love and a strong sense of self-esteem, which should come from, from their parents, from the family unit. And, you know, that's reflected in the fact that so many children are turning to gangs and, you know, all this crime and stuff. I mean, you can't love yourself and kill your brother. When I was a child, my mother cut this from my hair when she was sold away from me. Now, I add them on old hair. It is the way I think that black parents, when they couldn't give us first class citizenship, they gave us a first class sense of ourselves and they gave us all the tools that gave us an armor to protect ourselves against the things that would deprecate us and make us feel less than a hundred percent person. I was responsible for my family. I was responsible to see that they were clothed and housed and loved. The truth of it is that little girls and little boys need both men and women telling them that they're special, that they're beautiful, that they're loved, that they can be somebody. And if a parent or an adult puts that in you, nobody can take it away from you. The teenage years are such difficult years, uh, particularly for African-American children. So the 
most important thing that we can do to prepare our children for adolescence is to have them have great childhoods and to really feel good about themselves. When they think they can just judge you by the way you dress, uh-uh. I always get A's and B's in all my classes. I'm the best student in my calc class. You see girls on the block and they're around the way and they're your home girls and you're like, well, they have no future. And that's another thing I wanted to dispel with this film is that they have a future and they want to succeed. But it's how you go about doing that. And are, are they being encouraged by boyfriends, by parents, by teachers? I had to walk past um, a lot of drug addicts and alcoholics on the corner to go to school every day. So I always had a vision that I wanted to get out of this. Well, I think we have a real responsibility as, as parents to help our children as they move into maturity to help black girls not lose their voices because little girls will tell you anything they feel. I have a good relationship with my parents. Um, I don't have any conflicts with them too often. We don't get in arguments or anything like that. I can talk to my mother more than my father. Me and my father, we don't really get along too much because he's never been around and I don't call that a father. So it's like we're okay, but it's not a daughter and father relationship, I don't think. I think my mother has just been an example for me. Um, she is graduating with me this year. She's getting her bachelor's degree from LaSalle University. And just watching her go to school at night and support me by herself, I think that's just been um, my inspiration to do well and to take advantage of opportunities now. So the biggest thing that inspired me was, was probably my daydreams about what I could become and my mother exposing me to so many things. I'm inspired to do public service and I guess my main inspiration for that is my father who is Shaka Patai. He's the state senator from Pennsylvania. I grasp many things from my mother and um, she inspires me to keep going on because I see that my mother doesn't have a college education and she can't do but so much because the job market requires a more education, more experience, and that motivates me, you know, to do my best in high school to get out and go to college and get my degrees and everything. All right, yo, Pat, I don't think they're gonna play this on the radio. <laughs> Why not? Everybody have sex. I mean, everybody. Should I talk to my mother about sex every day. I mean, I'm, it may come up like if I'm reading an article in a magazine or if I hear something or she's sharing some experience from, you know, a situation she's been in or one of her friends or whatever, but we talk about that um, subject very openly. Yeah, I don't talk about sex with my mom in reference to myself. We talk about images on television, we talk about society, issues in society that come up with sexuality, but I don't ask her about sex and about her sexual life and she doesn't ask me about my sexuality. There is a lot of pressure on young women these days from puberty on. As soon as these start coming out, <laughs> you know, as soon as she starts to look a little cuter, a little older, then here it comes, the pressure of saying no. And it's, it's amazing to me that someone, that, that I could do this too, uh, and that kids young, that girls younger than me, 13 and 12, are, ha are having children too. My pregnancy at 13 was not something that was planned. It was something that just happened. I had unprotective sex, and the result of that was getting pregnant. My mother did teach me about birth control pills, but one thing she didn't tell me about was sex. So that's something we really never talked about. One of the, um, the sad parts about teens having kids is that we actually have children having children. Um, and that cuts into to their own education, their own growth. And in 1966, you had some interested citizens who saw pregnancy as a problem that would take the girl out of the educational arena. So they created another school so that she could um, be a mother and then go back into the, her original educational setting. All the things she needs is right here. You have daycare here, you have a little school here, you got a small business here, you have a comprehensive health center here that takes care of all of her physical and psychological needs. If they see no future in their communities, which tend to be dependent, 
then it's okay to do it. Then you push a button and I'll just move on to the next step and, and become a teen mom. Will you give in under the proper circumstances? Will you wait until you love someone? Wait until you're married? Chances are you won't. For me, I believe it says for marriage. I wouldn't impose it on yeah. someone else. But I think if you want to, go for it. And I think I'm not marrying anyone that I haven't had sex with. I, I can't <laughs> go for that because it's just, to me, it's morally wrong. I've always been taught that you get married, you have your finances are fit, then you can think about having your children, then going on from there and, you know, have an order of your, what you want to do. Sometimes when I get up in the morning, I feel like I don't want to go on. And it just makes me realize that I brought these two children into the world and they are my responsibility, no one else's. So I have to make them a good, I have to be a good role model for them. And for young women, young black women, I think it is it's tremendously hard because they are prophesizing our, our youth's future. They're saying, they're telling us that by the age of 15, most of our black young women will have either had two abortions or one child. And I resent them telling me or prophesizing my child's future when her future is up to her. I mean, I remember coming up, you know, having a group of girls that, that would say things like, oh, you think you're something, don't you? And I'm like, yeah, don't you? Well, when I was being harassed by the other uh, children growing up, the different gangs and the um, reality of the ghetto that I lived in, I became a part of that. I uh, cut my hair very short. I started wearing uh, khakis and sweatshirts, and I was um, determined to get through that. Our, and there's an awful lot of our girls that don't feel good about themselves. Everyone needs love. Everyone needs support. And as long as you don't have the love and support that you need from your family, from your friends, you're going to be vulnerable. Finding yourself is the most difficult and rewarding and exciting problem in life. I think respecting yourself is the very beginning of it. If you respect yourself, then you will exude that to your community and you will get that back. Now those of us who were fortunate enough to have had parenting, it becomes our job to help the young parents learn how to parent because they don't know. To the delight of some races, we were considered round heel girls, which meant that our heels were round, and if we were pushed, we went right over and were in perfect position for whatever their their intent. My name is Tawana Brawley. Right. I'm not a liar and I'm not crazy. Like I have a daughter and she, she looks at these videos and she's trying to make the same moves that these females are making on these videos and it's not very becoming and this is the message that they're showing is that oh well if I dance like this I'm cool I'm cool like that you know you see this little woman flaunting around somewhere that's in I mean that's a standard for most videos be they you know one extreme or the other and I think that just comes from a male distorted perspective you know I don't think that that's even um, something that is is due to racism because unfortunately it's coming from black males as well. This, this is how I look at unrealistic images. I think it's something that you have to attack personally on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, with the people that you come into contact with because, you know, a lot of my friends, even like young black men, have negative images of women. I know I was in a club once jamming with them and the song came on and the girls went, ow, yeah! And I wondered, I said, now, okay, now what is the mindset of these young girls that they like hearing a lyric that says, bitch, better give me my money. 
I feel that it's unfortunate that a lot of African American males look at these videos and think, oh, this is what a female should be, this is what, how a female should behave. I mean, you may be dancing away and think the song has a really good beat, but then sometimes if I sit down and listen to the lyrics, it's, it's kind of makes me feel, I don't, just like, is that all I'm here for, you know, is to get you hot or something? Some females feel that that's the only way to be with a man, is that if they portray themselves that way, then they will have a boyfriend, then they will be loved, then they will be cared for, then somebody will like them and want to be with them. No, if you got to dance like that and dress like that just to make money, then uh, you shouldn't do it because there's a lot of other ways, you know, to make money and to show yourself, you know, you don't have to dress like that and, ooh, be all, ooh. <laughs> I, I think it's, I it's disgusting. Hey, uh, what I do with my students so that I can educate them in the right way is I, I, to find out what they're interested in, I'll ask them, tape your favorite video and bring it to class and let me see what's going on. They will bring videos to class where people are dancing half naked and everybody's got to go to bed with somebody. And then I critique it and I say to them, these people are just a few years older than you are. They're part of your future. Is this what you want? Is this what's getting ready to happen? Is this the generation that's going to take over? Is it going to be lust and sex and no brains? What is it? And then the kids go to thinking. And they say, well, they're just dancing, and they don't mean anything by it. And I say, you know, you practice at what you're going to be perfect at. These kids may not know the difference. Yeah, everybody's not a bitch or a hoe, but these kids may not know. And if they're not taught to know, that's, that's how they... They look at women, and that's how they look at black women, and that's not so. You know, it's like the word nigger, you know? I mean, that's something that black men ought to be able to understand without very much explanation, um, and why it is that they don't want white people calling them that. And so, by extension, you know, the same argument goes for women being called across the board bitches and hoes. It's not that complicated. Our young men who are five of them in our blended family are taught to respect women. That begins by the respect of their mother. That begins with the respect of their grandmother. And my mother, who is now deceased, they were taught and are taught on an ongoing basis to be careful about what comes across their mouth. Let's make it better. There's nobody holding these young brothers accountable for putting these lyrics and stuff out here. So, um, and I'm talking about young people who have a problem with it, and um, I don't think enough people are coming to them with it. If they hear it more from their peers, they probably react differently. We believe what we see in the media. And so when we see that young girls should be, girls should be wearing short, hot pants and, and, and gyrating all over the screen, that image is devastating because it does not reflect who we really are. The images that need to be challenged on TV, all of the negative things that we see. And I keep saying the reason that the negative things are there is because nobody will put the positive things on. Only the positive thinking, only positive images will change this world. I think that the media has always um, been unfair. Um, in its description and definition of the African-American community. I don't have any real expectation that they're going to change anytime soon. That's the biggest challenge is trying to get people portrayed in a manner in which they are recognizable to themselves because for the most part for, for the 20, 30 years that African-Americans have had a place in the mainstream media, this has been the battle. Entering the workforce, young women need to know that the job they begin with will not be the job they end up with. Our entire conception of careers has changed. And there are occupations that exist in the 90s that we had no conception of in the 1960s. Um, when I finished high school, I planned to go to college. I want to be a physical therapist. Um, right now, I can't afford to go to college full time, so I'll be working and going to college at night. Hamilton Holmes was the valedictorian in the class, and I was the third in the class. And they were looking for some young people who had good records, who were strong academically. And we were interested because I wanted to be a journalist. But they suggested that we go to Georgia State, which was the local uh, Georgia system college in Atlanta. 
And here we were, a couple of 17-year-old seniors, and we looked at the curriculum that they offered, and we said, this isn't good enough for us. We walked out of the building, and Hamilton stood there, and he said, this isn't going to work. He said, I want to go, and he gestured north. And I knew that he was talking about the university, and I said, well, so do I. There is racism and sexism, and so when those issues conflate, you get a situation where you have black students who don't want a white person to teach them African American history, or you have people assuming that a black person can't teach Greek classical literature. Anybody in the ideal world should be able to learn anything they want or teach anything they want. The fact that you are black, you are a woman, you are probably of a lower economic status, and you have to subject yourself to, to ideas that people have about you every single day. And I, I think that by dealing with those ideas, by confronting those ideals head on, you're definitely reclaiming yourself as a black individual. I first went to Ebony Magazine. Um, then I went to the Chicago Tribune. And um, I met writers, uh, older writers, both black and white, that could have encouraged me but either saw something threatening because I was extremely ambitious or something um, amazing because they felt that, and, and I was often told that they just didn't believe a, a black woman could write. I rode a bus all the way from Virginia up to do the amateur show and I won first prize singing a Bing Crosby song. I never did get my week in the Apollo at that time because I wasn't allowed to stay. I was in New York without my father's knowledge. So I had to get on the bus and go back to Virginia. But I had this feeling inside that uh, I would get back to that stage one day. And I finally did a few years later. And on my own, you know, as I got a little older and got outside the house and was down at Mr. Collins' juke joint down the corner, I heard Ruth Brown, and Laverne Baker, Dinah Washington, and Lil Esther. I remember working 56 nights straight, two shows a night, without a night off, and no one asking, how do you feel? You know, I, I, so there were some good times and some bad times. Everybody's gonna have to think again. There were a lot of naysayers and, and people who said basically, you know, keep your fingers nimble for that typewriter. In my approach to music in terms of the, the jazz overtones, um, I think again it goes back to my Aunt Lois. She had the, the Sarah Vaughan records, she had the Nancy Wilson records, she had the Lena Horne recordings. African American girls have to think beyond jobs. We really need to think about owning our own organizations, building our own companies. And that's, I feel, the only way that we'll ever be really empowered. My brothers and I grew up in the business that my parents started in 1964. Uh, I guess having that background and, and that upbringing um, is kind of the basis for me doing what I'm doing now and, and understanding um, what business means to a family and to a community uh, from having that, that uh, training and, and experience when I was younger. I think one problem that we have is that we want the payoff, but we don't want to work for it. Um, that's a, a large problem with people my age, at least, and that's why you have a lot of kids out here dealing drugs, because they want that fast money, but they don't want to do what has to be done in order to get there. The people who do well are not geniuses. Uh, they, they don't have a birthright to doing well. Uh, somebody helped them along the way, and they did the hard work along the way. And I would say to African-American women, you've got what it takes. All you need to do is just get in there, any opportunity you get, and exploit that opportunity and use it to just move to where you want to go. There was a moment when um, I had these white friends and they were talking about what they were going to do when they grew up and they were like, I'm going to be a housewife. So I came, tried that one on for size and came home and said, yeah, I'm going to be a housewife. And my grandmother slapped me and said, fool, you will be working. <laughs> you will always be working. <laughs> My mother, who before she got married was a captain in the military, 
at a time when black women were not in the military that much and certainly not <clears throat> black women who had risen to the rank of officer. I think that something else that did influence me into going into architecture is that it seems that improving the quality of life, the environment for people and especially for my people, that uh, that was important to me. When I started, it was 1967, uh, I migrated from Greenville, South Carolina. I came to Washington to go to beauty school. The guy that owned the salon that I'm working in now, that I own now, asked me, did I want to buy it? A year later, uh, I bought the salon. After that, I bought a salon in Rockville, from Rockville to Herndon, Virginia, from Herndon, Virginia to uh, Scanners Beauty Academy. Um, I was very lucky, you know, um, frankly. You know, my father got an award for being one of the pioneer black cartoonists, uh, Detroit Free Press. So his, you know, sent him a letter saying, congratulations, do you know of any other black cartoonists? We are, we're interested in having um, more uh, blacks on our comic pages to reflect our community. And of course, here I was, his daughter. I sent my work out to them, they liked it, and I was published. And it's a... Hmm, a social cartoon, that's, that's the way I describe it. It's black women talking about social issues. I just turned down a six-figure job, <laughs> okay, um, to do talk radio. And uh, so I would have the freedom to go on and pursue activities through my production company so that I can go on and continue and launch my clothing line so that I can continue uh, with my dreams of um, being in control. Whatever little bit it is, I want to be in control of that little bit. When it was time for me to open up a restaurant and to sort of segue out of modeling, and I went to work in a restaurant learning the restaurant business, and people would say to me, hey, you're a model. Why are you working in this restaurant? Things are a little tight now, huh? <laughs> and I'd say, no, I'm going to open up a restaurant. We are rocket scientists. We are astronauts. We are... Um, uh, journalists, uh, we're in international affairs, we have expertise in some areas that you never even heard of. At least 48 or 49 percent of newsrooms hire no minorities. When you look at a newspaper, you see that only about um, 11 percent of those bylines or by women. This man came to me and he said, yeah, you've done very well. Your business and your proposal, everything is in order and your product is fine. But there's one thing. I said, excuse me? I said, oh, okay, well that one thing is a different business than what I'm into. So I guess our business is concluded here. There are times when I open up the mail, when I get hate mail, that uh, makes me very unhappy. It is enough to to make you think about what you're doing but it's not not enough to stop you from doing what you're doing as a matter of fact it makes me get ready to rev up more and like ah, ah, throw those punches and get right back in the ring <laughs> we are. my challenge is being a woman minister has been very very exciting shall we say because the men in the city where I live always saying what I can't do. They even challenge me with questions and ask me, do you know that you're a woman? Yes, I know that I'm a woman. Do you know that you're black? Well, I've always been black and I've always been a woman. That spiritual side is, is a very important thing in a business where there is no loyalty, there is no uh, sense of, of uh, support. I made good decisions early on and they have uh, followed me through. Uh, I have a feeling that as I get older, those decisions would have been harder to make. I'm just grateful that I made wise ones as a young woman. We only learn to run from the witch doctor. We know now that your medical doctors of today are pursuing the witch doctors to find out how to cure you. 
Charles Drew University arose out of the ashes of the Watts riots of the 1960s as our community struggled and protested against the extraordinary inequities, one of which, of course, was the, uh, the inequality of health care and the terrible health statistics and realities for the people that live here. They demanded and achieved the creation of a hospital, and eventually out of that hospital arose a school of medicine, an allied health school. Cancer of the breast, every black woman ought to make sure that she knows how to examine her breasts and does so every month of her adult life. And regarding cancers of the cervix, this is fundamentally important that we have access to regular and continuous screening programs. Screenings that can occur in the church basement, screenings that can occur in a specially designated and roped off and secured area in a public and assisted housing project. Wherever we congregate, health professionals can come and provide these kinds of screening services for our women. So there's no excuse for us as a community to allow our women to continue to die unnecessarily from these kinds of cancers. Four of my siblings did die three at birth and one had lived a very, very short time. And this was due in part, greatly in part, to the segregated South, hospital care, housing, food, uh, food patterns, and just simply a life that was not fair in the sake of economics. Black babies die twice as often in infancy as white babies do in this country. And we have to be very, very concerned about the diets and the nutritional status of African-American women. While we give special names to those we think have AIDS, the AIDS virus has infected one million people of all ages, from all walks of life. Just as tragic, thousands have been born with this deadly disease. It is important that we realize that the incidence of HIV disease and AIDS is a major problem for African-American women, for the African-American community, and also, and very tragically, for African-American children. Most people out there who, who, ha who are carrying AIDS don't know that they've done anything to get AIDS. And, and it's like, it's so hard to get into, their, into, into guys' minds that this is a real problem. If you're looking for someone to settle down with, uh, then that's well, a whole, well, whole different by topic. That, if you're in a relationship with somebody, oh, and it's definitely. supposed to be a monogamous definitely. relationship, and it's considered okay to kind of sleep around outside no, of that. that um, exactly, that exactly. Would, would, would people be accepting those types of things? It's not right. Conversation. Today we have very pre capture is the sacredness of sex. That's right. Sex is mm -hmm. sacred. I mean, if you need to have an orgasm, you don't necessarily need another person. That's but I think true. that once you, I mean, well. take off your clothes and you're going to lay with somebody, that should be somebody who you really want to embrace. How many guys you know me? Let's talk about sex, baby. I think if we just, as black people, started being more concerned, you know, about how AIDS is specifically affecting our community and, and just tearing it down, you know, we would do more about it. I think um, the availability of contraception and family planning is one area that um, could be enlarged in our community. Poor women with proper education and information will do the precautions that are necessary and also know that whatever form they use, including Norplant, it must be backed up by the use of a condom. Hello, son. Hi. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think of my kids as a priority and you wonder how they are, what they're doing. You might say little prayers throughout the day, you know, God help them, protect them, keep them safe, and at the same token, continue to bless me so that I can keep my sanity. Being that he's been able to be a part of this Children's Center program has allowed him to reestablish that bond that we've had. It means everything to him and me to be able to interact with one another. It's very important that that child understand that the mother loves the child, that the mother didn't do this on purpose to be away from the child, and we try to keep that connection there. And that helps the child in the healing process. These are people who have to not only 
to not only meet the responsibilities that they have to themselves as individuals in a complex and often unfriendly society, but they also have responsibilities for not only children, but for men in their lives. They have responsibility for adult parents, even for grandparents. And so the degree of tension and stress that they are under is enormous. We have a lot of problems that black women face today, but I think one of the single most important problems is that in-house racism, discrimination against one another that we cannot seem to overcome. brushed straight back with a flowing ponytail and spit curls. In the very beginning, I wore just, just my natural cut, close crop, almost what they're wearing now, the close crop. But I always said that Elvis Presley got his spit curls from me. And I remember deliberately putting bleach and detergent in my hair to change the texture so people could stop singling me out as the one with the white people's hair, which I couldn't figure out how I had white people's hair and my body was navy blue. And you get people who who have this distorted image that, you know, long, beautiful hair is nice. And I, and I had really long hair before this, and it was, like, really soft or whatever. Like, oh, you have pretty hair. <laughs> but, you know, as soon as I cut it, it was like, how could you do that? It was a big decision for me to stop perming my hair. I got laughed at on the street. Mm -hmm. People were yelling me off the bus, you have nappy hair. But I have never felt more comfortable, more beautiful in my life. I know that I used to hate, you know, the way my hair was, the way my hips were. You know, I wish I could look different. And then I decided, you know, hey, this is me. I'm going to love me for me. I'm going to embrace everything about me. And I wish that every black woman could do that for herself. You know, it's about really coming to, you know, to yourself and defining what beauty is to you and not looking to these sort of external reflections or whatever for your sense of self and your sense of beauty. And it's been very difficult uh, up to this point at 22 to define who I am without looking in the mirror. It's just not, you know, black or white, but you're also saying because, oh, well, it's fair, and what degrees of fair, and it's hair, and what degrees that your hair is, and um, it would be nice that when we could really see the beauty, when we could read a really nice poem. I think the biggest problem is getting the opportunity to have these ideas challenged in some form. I mean, in classrooms, in, in our music, and in other forms, and, and, um, and getting black people to think critically about themselves as individuals. <laughs> Growing up, you know, you get to those awkward adolescent stages and stuff, and my mother would just soup us up like we were, you know, God's gift to humankind. And that's all a child needs. If you hear it from your mother and father, it doesn't matter if you look like Ooga Googa. It does not matter. You think you are fine because your parents told you that. I'm happy that today I can go into a bookstore and find wonderful, wonderful books to read to my six-year-old or to give her so that she can see positive black images of black women. I uh, advertisement that is out now is the, I believe it's a Coca-Cola ad when they say they were looking for the average American girl. The ad said they were looking for the classic all-American beauty. So I thought to myself, <laughs> hey. And it's uh, a dark complected African-American woman with her short crop fro, her full lips, and obviously Negroid features. It took someone who I was dating to teach me that my body was beautiful. And it's a shame that it took that. My mother told me I was beautiful. I believed I was beautiful. But my body, my big breast, you know, is something that I always was, wonder, ner you know, nervous about. We spend so much time and energy trying to fix ourselves and change ourselves and make up and rearrange ourselves. Energy that could be used in so many other ways to move ourselves forward. There's a line from a 19th century folk song in which a black man spoke of the woman he loved. And it's probably one of my favorite poetic lines. He said, the woman I love is fat and chocolate to the bone. 
and every time she shakes, some skinny woman loses her home. <laughs> we survived. How is it that uh, the women still look at the black man with a twinkle in their eyes? And how is it that the black man still looks at the black woman with a, a wry smile and a hopeful grin? How? When I was so strong and so and I made a vow, so I tell you no. Yes, we have some problems now, but we know that the whole power relationship between men and women is changing. It takes commitment and work to maintain a relationship. And that means a relationship between a man and a woman, uh, a relationship between family members, or a relationship between friends. You have to work at relationships. I don't think there's any re relationship that's more important and more communal than the husband-wife relationship. And I still a firm believe, believer that when you stand up there and you say those marriage vows that they mean something. People, even my husband for example, before uh, he met me, I, I had an album out uh, that I think maybe like five people bought and he was one of those five people. But he said to me that he thought I was lonely. Thought of me as a lonely woman and someone that, that needed to be taken care of. The scales are sometimes unbalanced And you bear the weight of all that has to be I hope you see that you can lean on me And together we can come the snow me Women who have a true desire to have uh, lifelong companionships, marriage-type situations, are having to redefine their loyalties and their priorities. My mother's like one of my closest friends because when I need to talk about anything, it could be anything from school to work to maybe even boy problems, she's there for me and it's not hard to talk to her because she, she can relate to me. She's also my best friend. Um, I can tell my mother anything. One of the most wonderful things I see on television is big basketball players who, uh, before they can accept their award, they thank two people, God and their mama. See, Daddy, sinners have soul, too. So my father has always been um, a very important force in my life, and I, I feel very lucky because I look around, my, around at my friends um, from home and relationships they have with their parents and their fathers in particular, and my father is the one who was always there. What I'm doing with six children is just a drop in the bucket. There are so many children out there that need um, parenting. And also, I have my parents, both of my parents, um, who are grandmom and grandpa to them, so they do have a male figure, and it's not just me, and they're all my support. So I certainly consulted them before um, I made the decision to be a foster parent. When we, as women, come together, we support each other, we're cooperative and collective, we strengthen each other. And if we don't begin to really rejoin and, and, and give give energy to those relationships again. Once those relationships between black women are fractured, then black people have really lost something. I'd like to see more investment within our own community. My dream for myself is to raise uh, a strong black male child you know, who can go outside and play amongst friends, you know, and I, where, in a neighborhood where I don't have to worry about, you know, whether or not that next gunshot I hear is directed towards my child. I was doing my will and my older children said, well, mom, what are you leaving us? Are you leaving us a house or are you leaving us a car? I said, no, I'm leaving you common sense and I'm leaving you some willpower and some strength and some wisdom. And they went, oh, my God, you know, we can't take that to the bank. I told them, no, you can pass the bank up. With that, you can buy a bank. Our youth are a reflection of what we taught them and what we didn't. If we neglected them, they will neglect us and they will neglect themselves.
and let us stop having all of these children that we refuse to sit and chat with and rear. Anybody could have a baby. It's rearing one that makes you distinguished. Our worth is not defined by who we make love to or how often we make love, but our worth is defined by our ability to go to school, to develop new knowledge, to implement new knowledge in the process of community and nation building. It was one fellow that told us it'd be a miracle if y'all get these places. So I truly believe in miracles and they come through God. So I would say to the young person, please learn how to turn within because everything that you need has already been placed inside of you. You have it. You are a powerhouse. Well, I would tell any black young African American sister to reach for the stars and do not stop until you have one in your hand. Just go for it. I like to see people being more encouraging of people who are determined to follow their dream and to get out there and encourage young people and kids that whatever you want to do, you can do it. Remind America that you count, that you belong, and that you're valuable people. There is no separation economically or racial separations would go away if, if some big monster came down from Mars, we would all be running to survive together. You're never in the land of the done. You're always in the stress of doing as an Afro-American. But what happens, you can either use it to say, I'm a victim, or you can use it to become better at what we do. Be motivated by where you can make your most significant contribution, how you can possibly affect a change. Uh, that's the art of life. What some people might consider strong may not be strength. It may just be facing a reality. I have no other help. I am on my own. If I want to survive, I had better do something. It may not be strength, it may be survival, an absolute necessity. And so she does it. This whole experience for me being here with such wonderful, dynamic, diverse women um, is, will be something that I know I will remember for a long, long time. What I've gained from being here with my sister friends is that there are issues among um, the cultural, the production of popular culture in medicine and in the arts that we have to deal with. But as we deal with these things, we are also dealing with redefining ourselves and placing ourselves at the power table in a speaking position. There is a place for us in this country as women and as a people. And once we realize that and really accept that we can be here and be a success at whatever we really want to do, take responsibility to do it ourselves instead of waiting some, for someone else to give it to us, uh, then we'll get there a lot quicker. And I stay pretty inspired, in part because of the history of African American women and the way we have shown our strength and our beauty and the way we've supported uh, each other. And that's what's so special about being here uh, because this is a display of that strength and that beauty. Uh, so I know we'll do it. I know uh, we'll get there. I think in many ways I feel renewed, renewed by this experience, renewed by the focus of this show. We need to have our lives examined. We need to be reminded of our strengths. And in many ways today has been a mirror that we've been able to look in and see how magnificent we are. I just think that today says to me, our crowns are already bought and paid for. All we have to do is wear them. We have to wear the crowns. I look at uh, some of the women coming up today and I'm proud of them and grateful that they exist. And it makes, it makes me feel that all my work was not in vain. Because the main thing is to 
leave footprints, delible footprints, so that somebody walking behind can say, this is a minefield we're, we're, we're walking in, you know? So if I've left a good footprint, then someone following can say, okay, it's safe to walk here. And it's safe to put my right foot here, because someone has gone before me. See. What can I say about my father? He died at the age of 83. And I mentioned his death first, uh, because I used to joke when he was 82 that he had already <clears throat> beat all of the odds on the insurance table in terms of the lifespan of black men. I used to tell him that he was too evil to die. He was someone <clears throat> that I was at odds with growing up. And once I became an adult, and as I tell him, once he became an adult, we became good friends. The week after he died, I had writer's block, and I was sitting at my computer trying to finish a chapter, and a book fell out of the bookcase. This was after I had called forth his spirit. And the book was um, Edith Bari Najeri's Every Goodbye Ain't Gone. And I opened it, and a letter fell out that he had written. And I didn't realize he had sent me the book. And it was the last letter that he had written, um, basically saying he loved me. Images and Realities, African American Women, was first made possible by AT&T. This special encore presentation has been made possible by the Ford Foundation.